Uh, here we go. Okay, a little background before we uh, start. In this chapter, the Alter Rebbe is describing the distinctive quality of human beings of neshamas and bodies. In that, they surpass the character of even the malachim, the angels. Now, we pointed out the technical detail that we use the term angels a little bit flippantly and a little over generically, but it is relevant uh, in the context that angels are comparable to animals. It sounds like an odd thing to say, almost insulting. And we explain because what it means is that just as an animal acts out of its impulse, its direction, its nature, similarly, angels too act exclusively out of their nature. They do what they are programmed to do. Whereas a neshama, once it's invested in a body, can, uh, can outpace its natural programming. It has the capacity and the, the ultimate purpose is to do more than simply what it is predisposed to do, the way like a wind-up doll is going to inevitably act out on its character. Concurrently, the Alter Rebbe sort of reassures us that even if, and I use this term somewhat uh, in quotes, all we do is act out of our natural predisposition to a love towards Hashem, we should not underestimate that because it does parallel that of the angels. And in a certain sense, it's even more profound than that of the angels because we have all kinds of other factors that are competing for our attention. So yes, a child loves its, his mother. Um, that's a wonderful thing. And we might say, well, what do you mean? That's just natural. Yes, but life tends to bombard us with all kinds of competitive attractions. And therefore, that ability even to maintain our instinctual love should not be underestimated. It is still a pretty uh, remarkable. And yet, though, it's not the goal. So it's sort of a reassurance. And yet, don't, don't make that uh, reassurance into a hammock to be lazy about. Our ultimate mission is to do more than we are simply programmed to do. And that's what makes us superior to the angels. Now, you may recall, I could put it back on the screen just for a moment. Um, if I, I think I can at least. Come on. Hold on. Uh, oh, here we go. Here's the chart that we spoke about last week. Uh, the different stages of awareness, where the angels are, which is just above this physical world. So we are born here in the world of Asiya, where we are naturally obedient or, or we have a natural proclivity, a character of the human. The angel is a step above us. We can reach even beyond that level, even up to these levels that are total awareness in our relationship with Hashem in Bri and Atzilis when we overcome our uh, uh, sort of tug of war between the natural and the non-natural. It's a nice little hashkacha pratis that today is Rosh Chodesh because one of the opportunities that, we, that gives us this ability is in fact Rosh Chodesh. When it's Rosh Chodesh, we get this opportunity as we will discuss. So here we go. Ach, again, if you're following in the standard print like this, regular Tanya, it's page Nun Bey's the last word on the line. If you're in the lessons in Tanya or in the other prints, it's the chitas that begins for the eighth day of Nisan in a standard year. Um, and again, it's about, uh, I don't know, page and a half into chapter 39. So here we go. Ach, however, hainu dafin neshamas mamish. This is when we're talking about just the neshama. Now, like so many things in life, wouldn't it be so much simpler if we didn't have any competition? Uh, if we, we, we drew up our, our plans and there weren't other factors, whether that factor is the weather, you know, you talk about this uh, historically in military circumstances where they have these great plans, but if it rains that day, you know, the space launch and all its billions and billions of dollars and genius and genius has to be suspended. Why? Because there are other external factors that prevent the execution of what is otherwise a pristine, and I'll use this term, perfect um, plan. So when we're talking simply about the neshama, then the neshama is called moichin the godless of the infinite light of Hashem, of the infinite of Hashem. Now, moichin the godless translates as expanded mind or big mind, big intellect. 
Now, this is not to be confused with the concept of being a genius and knowing hundreds of pages of Torah but from memory and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. It is rather about the capacity for the person to be expanded beyond just um, his routine. It is the ability to get over himself. It is the ability to use his intellect to reach beyond himself. Um, and that's the quality of the neshama in its own level. Remember we talked about that the, we, we have talked about this many times before, in the five levels of what we generally refer to as the soul, and I'll use that term specifically, we have basic existence, that's nefesh. We have what it is that we live for, which is our character, which even an animal can have, which is uh, ruach. And then we have the distinctive quality of human beings, which is neshama. You recall that in the story of creation, Hashem blows the breath of life into Adam and brings him to life, this uh, model made of dust. And the word for breath is neshama, or nishmas, v'yipach v'apav, and God blew into his nostrils, nishmas chayim, the soul of life. So when we use the term neshama, we tend to use it sort of generically to refer to our spiritual side. In this context, when we're being much more particular, it is the distinctive human quality, which is the idea of thinking. Now, it's important that we not confuse thinking with conditioning. An animal can learn to not chew up the slippers because every time he does it, he gets the newspaper across the snout. But that's not thinking. That's simply conditioning. Thinking is the capacity to go beyond what is immediately obvious to me. And the hardest part of thinking is that I have to recognize that life and the creation and existence is more than just me. It's not just how it measures to me. I like it. I want it. I see it. I touch it. And it's a very difficult thing. You know, we talk about great men of vision in business who come up with an idea that is completely original. It is like we call it out of the box. You know, we're familiar with these phrases, completely outside of anything else that they have seen or heard before. That's true intelligence, imagination, and so on. So when we're talking about the neshama, we're talking specifically about this capacity called moichin, translates as brain or intellect, of godless, that is expanded, as opposed to being very regimented and uh, only narrow down to what I can see right in front of me. Moichin de gas, like we might call it creative, something along those lines. Aval, however, bechines haruach shel hatzadikim, the ruach quality, the ruach is the character, sometimes we call it the emotion. And as we pointed out in the beginning, why are we talking about tzadikim? This is a book for Bainanim. This isn't a book for tzadikim. And the idea is that it's the aspiration of each of us, like we swore to be a tzadik and not a Russia, even though, as we understand, we may never achieve it. But it is our aspiration to reach beyond ourselves. And it reminds us of the capacity of the human, the neshama in the body specifically, to uh, uh, outpace, to lap the malach, the angel. And that's why it says, all neshamas of the Jewish people. So the tzaddik is the person who has done more. You know, and it's, I don't know if it's a perfect analogy, but it's the old, you know, man versus machine idea. We can develop machines that can be perfect and never make a mistake, but they don't have creativity, even though they can learn, you know, with spell check and so on that we are so familiar with. Um, Hashem, that they serve Hashem, who serve Hashem, and I use this term again, very guardly, only, and I don't mean that as an insult, although it sounds that way, they serve Hashem with the love, with the fear and the love that is hidden or is hidden away. It is in the basic uh, package that you get in your very identity because you have an neshama that's a part of Hashem and everything longs for its origin. So it is embedded in the heart of every Jew. So they are serving Hashem with that which they are given. So on the one hand, this would seem to be sort of, I don't want to call it a negative, but it would seem to be a non-accomplishment. You get this in your packaging and you're doing it. 
you know, it's like you inherited a dollar and you have a dollar. So what? You didn't do anything. That's the way you came. You got it and you still have it. Okay. Yes, it's true. You could lose it and you didn't lose it, but we don't, we, we don't commonly think of that as some sort of great accomplishment. Yet here, the Alter Rebbe is not just sort of patting us on the back and saying, well, that's okay. You know, as long as you tried your best, it's not some sort of uh, condescending, uh, um, um, I can't think of the word, uh, sort of patronizing um, affirmation. What the Alter Rebbe is saying here is that when we, in fact, serve Hashem, and the crucial word there is serve, as we learned earlier in Tanya, serve means to do more than simply what we are programmed to do. And remember, the classic illustration is the transformation of animal hide into leather. It's not going to happen by itself. It requires enormous effort to transform the raw, uh, a hard hide into the soft leather that we make shoes from and so on. When we do that, um, we are serving Hashem. Uh, uh, that is, we employ our natural uh, fear and love of Hashem that is embedded within us. Ein Hashem, right? It will not get outside of itself to that degree. It will still be within that degree, except, and here's what we talk about, rak b'Shabbos Rosh except on Shabbos and Rosh Chodesh. We'll talk about what, what it is about Shabbos and Rosh Chodesh. On the one hand, it's just a given that that's a sort of a mystical level, that it's an elevation. Many are familiar with the idea that had Adam and Chava waited until Shabbos, they would have been permitted to eat from the fruit of the tree because on Shabbos, everything becomes elevated. We're familiar with this, that eating a, a during the week has to be very concentrated. Why am I eating? Because I need nutrients. Why do I need nutrients in order to serve Hashem? Whereas on Shabbos, the eating itself is the service of Hashem. So we chuckle about that and say, sure, that's why we all overeat, and that's why we love the good food, and we're not against it. But what is really the spiritual message? Why is it that we eat? It would seem that Yom Kippur would be holier if we don't eat. Why are we eating on Shabbos and we're eating all this specifically delicious food? And again, beyond the cynical side, which could be true, that maybe it is overly indulgent, it is the idea that on Shabbos, everything becomes elevated, everything becomes spiritualized, as we'll talk about on Rosh Chodesh as well. Let's just finish the sentence. Derech HaOmud, which is this, this, it's called this path, this pole, literally. That is, it takes us at that moment to the level of Bria. It takes us to this level that we ordinarily can never reach. So we are working over here in the world of Asiya in action. And we're doing the right actions. The Yitzira, which is the world of the angels, is this emotional level. So if we can get our emotions, and it's not only our obedience, that I put up the mezuzah and I eat the matz and I shake the lula. We then take ratchet it up another level where our emotional character, which is what we fear and love. And again, fear, not in the sense I'm afraid it's going to hurt me, but our reverence and our love, which we can get ourselves to Yitzira. How are we going to get to this level of closeness? Remember, when we talk about the, the worlds, we're not talking about just some sort of destination. We're talking about a stage of awareness. So how do we get a state to this stage of greater awareness? It's not something that most of us are going to be capable of doing because we still are rooted and anchored in ourselves. So we understand Torah as it enriches us, directs us, guides us, and so on. We become emotionally excited. I want to feel close with God. I feel a reverence for God. How can I get to this level, a level that is ordinarily born of the intellect? So on Shabbos and Rosh Chodesh, we get a booster. We get boosted up. And this is similar to the idea of the wings that Hashem attaches to our mitzvah actions. In other words, Hashem helps us be close with him. Now, as a general rule, we know this already. We're familiar with this already because it's the opening line of the Amidah. Just a quick review, and we're going to see it a little bit later in the chapter. We probably won't get there today. In the Amidah, in the structure of the davening, let me rephrase, we find a similar pattern to the four worlds. The first part of davening is, thank you, Hashem, for all the things that I like, for vision, for mobility, for material things, the morning brachas. We are talking about ourselves, 
And we are acknowledging that the things that we have, that we appreciate, come from Hashem. So we wake up first thing in the morning. We're very much aware of ourselves. I am aware. Uh, and we are grateful to Hashem about the things that we have. But it's still very much centered around myself. Then we begin to move into the davening and the psuke, the zimra, the songs that speak of the praises of Hashem. And, in, in, and we, instead of talking about all the things that Hashem does for us, we start to talk about Hashem in his pure identity. All the praises from the books of, from, from the, the chapters of Tehillim, of Psalms, all the praises in the other parts of the davening are all speaking about Hashem. That is that emotional level. I'm calling it emotional. I'm not sure if that's the proper word, but that it's that sense of a desire to be close with God, a fear of being distanced from Hashem. Then we come to the Shema. And in the Shema, we cover our eyes, we block out everything else, and we declare that God is the sole determinant of our lives. And therefore, we will love Hashem, we will revere Hashem, and we'll do the mitzvahs. Teach it to our children, bind it on our arm, fix it to our doorpost, etc. Then we get to the Amida. Now, the Amida is, as we stand like the angel with our feet together, because that's how angels are described in the vision of Ezekiel. And the idea is they're absolutely rooted. So the upside there is they'll never regress. The downside is they'll never progress. They'll never go forward. So in that moment, we stand like the angels. So much so that we call it the silent prayer. Why is that more silent than every other part? Why is it that we shout out the Shema? And the rest of the davening, we are strongly encouraged to verbalize it. And sometimes people are even, you know, mum, 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 you know, they give it the real mumble. And even though it's not always the most pleasant thing. So why is it that when it comes to the Amida, it's supposed to be silent? Because in essence, when we sense that we are standing before Hashem, Ein Soiv, Infinite One, etc., we should be silent. If we're standing before the, 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 the Lord of hosts, we're not talking, we're quiet. However, we are instructed to, to speak. So what's the first line of the Amida in that small print? We say, Hashem, Sefasa, my lips, Tiftach, Ufi, in my mouth, Yagi, Tehila, Secha, should speak your praises. In other words, we are asking Hashem to help us be close with him. We can think about this in an interpersonal relationship. If we want to be close with somebody, we might ask them, what makes you feel close? What is it that I can do? Will you let me in? on this close relationship? Will you open the door and allow me to be close with you? So here on Rosh Chodesh and on Shabbos, we get this boost into the level of Gan Eden. Now, the Alter Rebbe just quotes this because it's not the objective of Tanya to give us a Kabbalistic interpretation. It's just sharing with us that we get this opportunity on Shabbos and on Rosh Chodesh. And sort of the Alter Rebbe, that, as far as it serves his purpose, that's sufficient to know that these are special moments when we get that opportunity for an uplift. What is it specifically, though, about Shabbos and Rosh Chodesh that gives us this booster that we may not get when it comes to uh, ordinary weekday? So we explain because both Shabbos and Rosh Chodesh, uh, so to speak, I don't know what the word is, commemorate um, the distinctive creative characteristic of Hashem. We know that Shabbos in its most basic element is a celebration of God's creation of the whole world. God created the world in six days, he rested on the seventh, which is the ultimate reminder that this world belongs to Hashem. It doesn't belong to us. The, the objective that we're reaching for, this what I'm calling creative or intellectual, moichin the godless character relationship is linked to this basic idea that we that this is God's world and we live in it as opposed to this is our world and what does God have to say to make my life better that classic thing you know what does Shabbos do for you why do you like Shabbos so much it's not a bad thing we're not against it but we should never forget that we don't keep Shabbos because of how meaningful it is to us because one day what if it's not so meaningful you know, what happens if the food burns and we forgot to turn off the light and we missed our favorite uh, activity and everybody was just, uh, so then we don't have to keep Shabbos anymore? Of course not. So the idea is not that um, Shabbos, well, I shouldn't say not. It's not only that Shabbos uh, gives us rest and uh, peace of mind, etc. All good things, not against it. The essence of Shabbos is 
that this is God's world. He created it and he rested. And therefore, on, on Shabbos, when we have this awareness, Hashem is inviting us. Hashem finished all his work and he invites us in to this level that we would otherwise not be able to achieve. A similar objective is reached on Rosh Chodesh. I mean, we, you know, we ask the fundamental question, why is it that there has to be the cycles of the sun and the moon? So again, like we know, the Jewish people are compared to the moon, just as the moon reflects the light of Hashem. So too, the Jewish people, ref I'm sorry, the moon <laughs> reflects the light of the sun. So too, the, the Jewish people reflect the light of Hashem. The moon was initially made as big as the sun, but it became smaller so we could do this service and then it will rebound to that level. That idea, you know, we think at the end, you know, we're, we're gone, it's never coming back. And then it does come back, this idea of revival and return, you know, in the winter, the trees look dead, but in the, they come back in the spring and they blossom and they're filled with greenery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So the Alter Rebbe continues. Uh, what is a bit about Olam Habriya, that level of awareness? And again, it translates as the stage of awareness of the world where all we know is Hashem, the creator. It's not so much about the particulars, it's about Hashem, um, which is called this higher level of Gan Eden. doesn't mean there's better cookies there. It means is greater awareness, greater alignment with Hashem, this absolute closeness. Um, al Hashem, to have, and again, it translates as pleasure with Hashem. Now, again, this is just my own uh, materialistic character. To me, when I hear pleasure, I hear about butterscotch ice cream, but it's not about the stimulus pleasure because those pleasures get, uh, 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 we can identify because when they're done, we're unsatisfied. <laughs> When's the next one? Whereas what we're talking about, I like the word alignment, whatever, choose a better word. When you feel absolutely that you are in the right place, you're in absolute alignment and oneness with Hashem. I use the example, you know, when a person comes to shul on Yom Kippur or Kol Nidre, they're not thinking, you know, really I should be down at the truck pole, you know, or, uh, you know, at the baseball game. They know this is where they're supposed to be. There's no doubt. There's no conflict. That's truly what Gan Eden means. Remember, in the original Gan Eden, all this is acceptable. This is unacceptable. Okay, there's still a, a challenge as to compliance. There is clarity, though. I know exactly what is and what isn't. Outside of Gan Eden, out here in the world, not only do I have to have the resilience to do the right thing, I don't always know what the right thing is. <laughs> There, there's all kinds of uh, confusion as to what, in fact, is the right thing to do. It's all mixed together. Okay. So, what happens here? When the person is raised up to this level, and he has this pleasure, this alignment with Hashem. And thus he is able to benefit. And again, these words, the English words, and again, maybe it's just my shallow self, they, they, they don't really capture the idea because they, they, they're the same words that we use when I liked it. I like this food, I like this place, I like this car. These are all things that serve me. We're talking about a level where, where the person is uplifted and thus, they are completely aligned, and they know where they are. And as such, they're able to have this level of Hana. Now, ordinarily, in order to have a full alignment, I have to be able to have some degree of appreciation of what it is. Meaning, not just that it's the frustration of, uh, of, of calculus, and therefore I don't understand it, and therefore I can't say I enjoyed calculus because I don't understand all the rules of calculus. There's a, a more subtle, or I don't know what the word is, there, there's sort of a different perspective that the Alter Rebbe is trying to bring to us here. So here's, let's say, sort of back, back up a minute, and we'll see what's going on. So we're dropped down here into this physical world, and we are constantly bombarded with the pursuit of the material. And I'm not talking even about indulgences, just the basic survival. I have to eat, and I have to drink, and I have to sleep, all of the human capacity that is necessary. And so 
I start out, and much like Avram Avinu, the basic story, I have an intuitive sense that there's something more to creation than just the creation itself. There's something more than just the, what I can see in, in my face in front of me, and that is the distinctive quality of being human. You know, I, I don't know. At some level, I'll use this over generic term that's certainly not true. You know, everybody at some point says, you know, what's the meaning of all of this? Now, this is the difference between a human being and an animal. Again, the animal never questions. It never has. It that's it. It it it, ha, it goes through its routine. It survives. It reproduces. It eats. It sleeps until it's, it passes. That's the role of an animal. That's what it does. It doesn't have a strategy. It doesn't have an awareness that there's something more to life than simply survival. That that is an animal. So what happens in, again, over generalization, riddled with exception, et cetera, et cetera. So let's take what we're familiar with, you know, our typical uh, 20th into the 21st century U.S. Uh, uh, experience. So a person is born into, the, in, into a family. Hopefully they are not literally li uh, struggling to survive. They have food, they have a roof over their head, and they have basic functionality. And at some point, there's like, you know, what is the point here? What, what are we doing here? So what does the world say? The world says, what do you want more than anything else in the world? What is your passion? So most kids go, I don't know. How am I supposed to know? I'm 10 years old. I'm 15 years old. It's a classic thing. Maybe it's more boys than girls. They say, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. I'm six. I have to know now. <laughs> I don't know. Who know. I don't know what I want to be. I'm just trying to sort of figure it out. So the constant message, and I'm not even talking about the Madison Avenue Hollywood message, I'm talking about even in a healthy uh, human message, is what do you want? And now figure out a way to get it. So what do you want? You want to grow up and you want to have a family and you want to have a house, you want to have two cars. Well, those things cost money. So you got to get a job and uh, you got to get a job that pays enough. So you try to, you make a, a, a budget. You know, how much work am I willing to put in? Um, in order to achieve how much wealth that I need. And what is the ultimate goal is to be able to come home and sit on the couch. And this is the constant message. You know, this the Rebbe spoke about a lot in the 60s, you know, the, after the war, there was understandably a lot of desire for that. Wouldn't it be nice just to be bored? You know, we had too, a little too much excitement. We had the depression, we had the war. We'd like to, to be bored. That would be nice. And that was sort of that idyllic sense of the 50s. Everything is sort of nice and calm. But people rebelled against it because there is this innate sense, this this fear and love that is embedded within the heart of every Jew, that there's something more to life than simply, quote, success. So what happens, though? The world starts to sort of beat down on it. It says, no, no, that you need... You know, the, the constant the constant pursuit, keeping up with the Joneses, et cetera, et cetera. And we know how that plays out. And I'm not even talking about the most extreme or repulsively materialistic or obsessive or competitive uh, character. I'm talking about even in a healthy sense. You know, this is what it is, you know, to quote unquote, succeed in America. Now, what is it squashing is this desire for something, what I'll, I'll use the word transcendent. There's more to life than just the fulfillment of my needs and desires. There is something, this great desire for almost heroism. And again, I know I'm being uh, cliched and so on, but yet it sort of illustrates a point. This is why people go bungee jumping, because they used to go to war. <laughs> now, thank God, people of my generation, they didn't go to war. So where are they going to get that thrill? So they go bungee jumping or they look for you know, some sort of great drama and trauma. Why? Again, because it, that is the truly our desire. We think all we want is uh, to sell our business and retire at 30 and sit on the couch, but it's not even what we want. What we truly want is to be in our, in our relationship with Hashem. This is truly what we want. Excuse me, are you Jewish? Yes, you want to do. This is what you want to do. This is what your neshama is clamoring for. Now, this is ultimately, quote unquote, getting over ourselves. That is the promotion from the world of action where we're just the kid, do what you're told, do what you're told. That's what we do. And then we wake up one day and we say, hey, you know, sort of, again, the classic American thing. How come I don't have all the things you promised me? I was a good boy and I went to school and I paid attention and I went to college and I went to graduate school. How come I still have to work? 
I thought you told me I was going to be, you know, easy street. So there's a lot of disappointment. But Torah, what, what the Alter Rebbe is thus describing to us is, our true desire is to be connected to the infinity of Hashem. So we start off with the obedience. Do what you're told. That's the world of Asiyah. Then we hope to nourish this innate drive to be close with Hashem. That's the world of Yitzira. That, that level of awareness. Again, we're trying to put definitive titles on innately infinite characteristics. You know, it's like trying to like colors you know this is a, a red seven i mean we're, 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 it's imperfect but we're trying to do it to give us some sort of handle and now we talk about this capacity to have an intellectual relationship with hashem not i, I don't mean here that i know all the data you know i've read all of the code of jewish law and all of the talmud we're talking here about engaging my intellect to the point that i get to beyond myself, outside of myself, and to this creative degree and lesson. This is the quality of Bria, of having that kind of awareness. The Rabbi Yasher Be'er Salavechik, who was known as the Rav, who um, uh, was the Rosh Hashiva in, in Yeshiva University and so forth, he once said about the Rebbe that other commentary commentators will tell you their opinion about Rashi. This is what they think about what Rashi, you know, the, the Rebbe had a, a program that he started in honor of his mother when she passed away in 1964 uh, to, to explain a Rashi comment in the, the Parsha. Now, that's not a, that idea is not original. There's uh, commentaries on Rashi. You know, Rashi is the simplest commentary, but we got commentaries on Rashi. Anyway, so Rabbi Salavechik said, the other commentaries tell you what they think about Rashi, but the Rebbe tells you what Rashi was thinking. Meaning we get inside the mind of Rashi, we, or in our context, we say we get into Hashem's way. Meaning, truly, we, could, we begin to be able to intuit God's will. I mean, this is really what we're after, to intuit God's will. Not this is what I think, arm's distance, but to, be, to, to start to think that way. If you think about an analogy might be the capacity to read. If you remember yourself or teaching a child how to read, so they sound out every letter and then they look at the letters and they sound out the word combinations. And then they have to remember that when you have certain letter combinations, they take on a different sound. It's a very laborious task, but at some point they can just read and they can't undo it. Everywhere they see, they don't see C-A-T, they see cat. They don't see the letters individually. They see this is what we mean, that, that is, language has become so unified with their identity that they now see everything through the lens of that language. That's an example. Imagine we would be able to do that in our relationship with Hashem. We would see everything through Hashem's eyes. We'd see everything through Hashem's eyes. We touch it from time to time, more than we think. And again, sometimes it's easier to see in other people. You ask a kid in Cheder, What's a quarter? He says, that's tzedakah. You know, people use that to buy food. Really? Oh, I guess so. Meaning, that's surprising. People use quarters to buy food. I thought quarters are for putting in the pushka. I thought water is for washing the That That is, we don't say, oh, it's Saturday. It's Shabbos. That's it. That, that is the reality. This is what we're talking about here. Again, not that I can rattle off 100 pages of the Talmud. That's certainly a, 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 an illustration of it. We're talking about here where our whole, I use this word mindset, it's kind of a silly word, our whole intellectual perspective, the whole lens of our, of our intellect is to see how, to see through the godly awareness. That's the whole way we see it. That's a quality. Again, we might touch it from time to time. That's how the tzaddik sees it. That's why the tzaddik sees the person as their neshama. That's why the tzaddik sees what the, the person needs. In their neshama, why is it when the person comes and they say, I have this problem, they're told you need to check your mezuzahs, you need to light Shabbos candles? Because just like a doctor trains themselves to see the symptom and thus understand the, the, the cure, the remedy, the tzaddik has so embedded the intellect of Hashem. And again, that word intellect is misleading. That, that perspective, that intellectual perspective, that he sees it in, in that godliness. Okay. Uh, so why is it that these neshamas 
should be able to have access that the malachim don't have. Now remember, we say it every morning in the davening. We describe after the baruch we describe out the srafim, which are angels that are on fire, the chayes hakodesh, the holy living beings that they declare kadosh. Kadosh means separate. They are standing off to the side saying, wow, Hashem is kadosh. Blessed is Hashem's glory in his place. Where's his place? Is here. So why is it that, again, you know, you can imagine how this got the Alter Rebbe, you know, in trouble. The Alter Rebbe says clearly that human beings, even if you're not a tzaddik, can have access to a level of godliness, a closest with Hashem, that the angels don't have. How is that possible? Even though they, and I use this word, the Altareb uses this word, only are serving Hashem with their intuitive love and fear. Seemingly, they're not adding any value. So how are they greater than the angels? As we describe, the angel is essentially like the animal. It does what it does. That's what angels do. It follows its, uh, its, its programming. It follows its intuition. So why is it that when the person follows his intuition, he's superior to the angel? He should be equal to the angel. The angel does what an angel does. A person does what a person does. And yet we're saying that when the person serves Hashem with his uh, innate, his, um, his uh, packaging, can't think of the right, the right word, his, his, his intuitive re- uh, reverence and love, He's elevated higher. Why? Why? Because of what the person overcomes when they engage their dechilu, uh, their reverence, their rechimu, and their compassion or love. Because the person has a sitra achra. He has an opponent who's embedded with him, which the angel doesn't have. So again, the, the Gashmius world likes to grade things objectively. Who's taller than the other one? Who's bigger than the other one? That's the way of Gashmius. Gashmius measures the, uh, the, the, the objective. But our relationship with Hashem is not based on the objective. So each one could be at level four. But this guy's at level four because he was born at level four, and that's, thus he stays. This guy's at level four, and he's overcome. A sim- maybe a better illustration is a very simplistic idea of owning a stock. So if I own a stock worth a dollar and you own a stock worth a dime, who's the better investor? It's a trick question. Because if I bought mine at $2 and you bought yours at $0.02, cents, you have quintupled your investment, and I've lost half. So it's not about the objective. It's about the rate of change. In this case, it's not even about a rate of change. It's about the capacity to reach a level despite the challenges. So yes, the angel serves Hashem with its intuitive packaging, instinctive love and fear. And the person is serving Hashem with its intuitive, uh, natural package of love and fear. Why then is the person considered getting the, why, not only considered, but gets this gift from Hashem to have this greater closeness? Because the person has to deal with the sitra achra. He has to deal with an opponent. And the angel doesn't have any opponents. It has no pushback. And therefore, its static arrival is not an accomplishment. Whereas the person, you know, standing tall in a, in a hurricane is in fact an accomplishment. Um, that is, he both has to avoid evil. To smother his tithes, his impulses. And in the pursuit of doing what he is necessary to do, what he is required to do. Because the person, why is it that he is able to achieve a greater closeness with Hashem than the angel, even though, again, on the surface, it appears that they are both, both human and angel, serving Hashem with their natural love and fear, fear and love. And the answer is because the person has this thing called choice. Now, the choice could empower him to do evil. And when he doesn't do that, when he resists that temptation, 
even though, quote unquote, he's not doing anything. But as the Gemara says, the Alter Rebbe doesn't quote this here, but it's a similar idea, that when a person sits and doesn't sin, he's doing all kinds of mitzvahs. He's not worshiping idols, and he's not murdering, and he's not gossiping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, the angel has no interest in those things. We've probably shared this story before. The Gemara says, this already is in the Gemara, not just in the Kabbalistic writings, that when Moshe Rabbeinu ascended to Har Sinai to get the Torah, the angels clamored. They said to Hashem, why are you giving the Torah to people? People are imperfect and they violate. Give it to us. We will never make a mistake. And Hashem said to Moshe, what do you say to this? And Moshe Rabbeinu said, I'm afraid, meaning it sounds reasonable. It sounds reasonable. But Hashem said to Moshe, hold on to the throne, meaning strengthen yourself, and you'll see, you'll find the answer. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu himself struggled with this. Probably not us, we're perfect, but other people struggle with this as well. Wouldn't it be nice to be an angel? Wouldn't it be nice if there were no potato chips in the world? I can't help myself from eating potato chips. Wouldn't it be better if there just weren't potato chips or whatever my potato chips is? If it didn't exist, wouldn't my life be so much easier? I'd humetically seal myself into a room and I'll have no access to whatever it is. But that's Gan Eden, and that's not where Hashem wants us to be. Hashem wants us to go and confront the potato chips and overcome them. And this is what Moshe said to the angels. What it talks about in Torah has nothing to do with you. You were never in Egypt. You don't have parents. You don't have the impulse to lie, cheat, steal, etc. Et so Torah is nothing to do with you. Torah is about overcoming that challenge, overcoming that temptation. Now, that's where choice comes in. Now, we know it's actually yesterday's parsha. I placed before you a blessing and a curse. The whole essence of our relationship with Hashem is predicated on this capacity for choice. You remember we quoted in the very beginning of Tanya that Eoiv, Job, said, Hashem, it's not fair. You created us to be righteous or wicked, which seemed to imply there is no choice. We went crazy. He said, well, no, no, no. He means he can create us with a certain propensity. But do we like choice? Answer, I hate choice. I make bad choices. Wouldn't it be nice if every day I got to print out exactly what to do? Right. It might be nicer and better, but it would not achieve any uh, transformation. Our goal is to transform the physical into the spiritual through resistance. So even though, quote unquote, I didn't do anything, but look at all the things I didn't do. You know, <laughs> every parent teaches this child, don't always go along with the crowd. And if they won't get in the car with the drunk driver, they didn't do anything. You know, they'll be much better off. So this is why the, the neshama in the body, what we call a human being, can have a more profound relationship with Hashem than the angel. Even though, again, on the surface, they both appear, but it's both the angel and the person to be doing the same thing. It's because of what the person has the opportunity to do that he doesn't do that transforms his entire um, character and brings him into this closeness with Hashem. And when we resist, we dispatch a glory of God in all worlds. This is a oft-discussed concept. In the Mimer, many are familiar with Abbas Lagani, which the previous Rebbe uh, uh, distributed in, in advance of what turned out to be his passing. He talks a lot about this idea, that when we resist temptation in a certain sense, we have a greater glorification of Hashem than even when we do a mitzvah which is one of the reasons why there's more don'ts than do's in Torah. 365, thou shalt not, and 248, thou shalt. Why? Because that's really where choice comes in. Simple illustration of this idea. We know, and it sounds funny, but there's no mitzvah in Torah to eat kosher food. Again, it was in yesterday's parsha. The mitzvah is to not eat non-kosher food. Okay, what's the difference? Because this is what separates the human being from the animal. An animal will also eat kosher food. The difference is the animal won't not eat the non-kosher food. The capacity for restraint is, in fact, the, 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 the essence of the distinctive characteristic for which Hashem created us in this world. The, the ability to not do things, to make choice not to, is what distinguishes the human being from the angel and why the human being can, can achieve a more profoundly spiritual relationship with Hashem. This is all in the characteristic and in the, in the sort of residence of Neshams. And where they stand. 
Ah, however, Tairos, Mavi Dos and Niklaus, Mamish be its fetus, Shahim be Kinis Elokus, Vorain Soif, Misyaka be Hematachas Ayichud. Now, what in fact is happening though, not to the person who still feels distanced, he put on tefillin and he didn't have some sort of magical experience. He resisted chametz on Pesach, and he didn't necessarily experience this intense closeness with Hashem. But what is in fact occurring? What is accruing in that spiritual sense? So while we said that the person is able to reach this level of um, the awareness of the infinity of Hashem at the stage of Bria, that greater closeness, he should be aware. And this, the Alter Rebbe, sort of you know, take, take his word for it, that the Torah and the mitzvahs that he is doing, although, again, like the classic thing, we had it in Pirkei Avos, way the, the, the apparent loss in doing a mitzvah. You know, it costs money, it takes a lot of time, it can be a real nuisance, a missing out on all the fun, Contrary, in contrast to its great joy. Now, we don't always see that great joy. It may, not, it may be down the road. You know, we don't have some sort of uh, Disney movie where dramatic music plays and we see instantaneously the consequence of our actions. Again, every parent knows this. You teach your child, you don't see the consequence, but somehow down the road, it kind of works out better. Why? How do you know? What's where? Again, this is post Gan Eden. You know, in Gan Eden, it's described that it's described with, with Mashiach, there'll be instantaneous consequence. You'll plant the seed, it'll immediately grow. Impatience in that sense is a virtue. Why do we have to wait? We have to wait because we're in Gullus. And in Gullus, we don't always get. And again, the one who skimps seems to get ahead. That, that, that is, in fact, our experience. So the Alta Rebbe here reassures us that while, <laughs> I know it sounds like maybe a funny way of saying it, but while the Neshama remains in the world of creation, again, that's that level, that Bria level, which is pretty good itself, the Torah and mitzvahs, mamish become one with it. Meaning, it's like the difference between being a visitor, a tourist, even if you're very familiar with it, you know your way around, and being at home. You're, you're there, you're at the place, but you know that you're sort of a bit of an outsider. Maybe you even feel like an imposter. Like, how could I be here? I mean, I don't belong here. I feel almost embarrassed to be here. Maybe that's an experience that the neshama has when it's in that quality of Bria. It, it, it's sort of a visitor, but he should know that his Torah and mitzvahs are absorbed there. That is real. That is not simply a sense of imposter syndrome. And this is a, a challenge because we feel like, oh, me, who am I? Now, that's a little bit the animal soul saying, oh, you think you're so holy? Come back and uh, indulge in, be in the common behaviors. But here the Alter Rebbe is assuring us that even though we may feel, again, like a bit of an outsider and struggle with that, know ye that your Torah and mitzvahs that are done with this awareness because of their execution of overcoming their um, uh, 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 natural proclivity to be self-aware and becoming God-aware, it is, in fact, a transformation. Um there is an absolute oneness in our Torah and mitzvahs, even though, again, because we're in Gullus, we don't see that consequence. We don't see that result. In the spheres embedded in the fabric of Bria. So again, back to my simple analogy. If I show up somewhere where I know that I'm sort of a visitor, so I'm there, everybody's very nice to me, but I know that I'm sort of like a, a, a tourist here. I really sort of, quote unquote, don't belong. But what I do there can have real impact. It can really transform. And it becomes absorbed into the very fabric of that stage of awareness. Um, well, the Yitzira, and in the Yitzira level, which remember Yitzira is one stage of awareness above our natural existence. It's where the angels naturally are. I'll put my chart up here again because I'm so proud of it. So we are born in this level. We are in Asiya, where we, we all focus on doing. When we get to this emotional level that we are drawn to Hashem, we can get to that level of Yitzira. We get the boost 
and we're welcomed into Bria, but we kind of feel like, you know, I don't know that I belong here. You know, <laughs> you remember in Pirkei Avais, I forget the author, he said, all my life I grew up amongst the sages and I found nothing better than silence. Why? Because he, he was invited into this level. This is where he was invited into Bria. And what was the purpose of silence? Because he wanted to absorb it. But what a person does when they're in this awareness does in fact become embedded in that fabric, even when, you know, maybe tomorrow he's not at that level of awareness, whether it's because Shabbos or Rosh Chodesh ends, or because maybe the next day he didn't always remember it. So again, like we always say, do not think that our Averis cancel out our mitzvahs. So even though maybe tomorrow I go back down to this level, because I'm not at Sadiq and I, and I don't resist my Sitra Akhra tomorrow, but the mitzvahs I did in this level of awareness, you know, it's very much the, the Tishrei message. We sort of compact everything in. We spend a, a month in this kind of level. We're consumed with godliness. All we're thinking about is the shoifer and the sukkah and the lulav and so on and so forth. And we don't have a minute to think at all about Gashmias. When we're at that level, uh, we know it's going to end, but we hope to take it with us. So the Alter Rebbe continues, and he says, uh, We become, in, in this level, you really have the Atzilis level, which is one that we would, quote unquote, never think we could touch. But nevertheless, it's there, because it's the same infinity of Hashem. So we're living in this world. We hope to have somewhat of an emotional level to get over ourselves. We get invited on, from time to time into this world, into the world of Bria we get invited to that intense level of closeness and we leave our mark there. And even if we regress back here, there is even this level of total bittal, total oneness with Hashem that trickles down to us in our little micro manners. You know, we talk about Masira Snefesh being at Silas. So Masira Snefesh, we think about the great heroes of our history. We have micro levels of that that are embedded in all the levels of worlds and as they trickle down to us. Uh, and of course, even Atzilis is a world, even Atzilis is a stage of awareness or, and, and sort of a diminishment of awareness. And what is it awareness of, of the infinity of Hashem? So again, we do a mitzvah. Sometimes maybe we have the experience, it's not a thrill. <laughs> we don't have this great, intense, spiritual uh, uplift. We shake the lulav, we do it. We hopefully get ourselves to the point where we, as we're doing during this month of Elul, so that we have a, 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 a desire. I really feel like I want to be close with Hashem. And we get ourselves over ourselves and up into a stage of awareness a little bit greater. So much so that we're not only consumed with what's in it for me and um, buy me, take me, get me, and does it meaningful to me, etc. And then comes a Shabbos or a Shkodesh or some other spiritual uplift, like we've talked about before in the past. Remember we, the concept of eating Mizumani in those special times when the Bainani experiences a quality of closeness comparable to the Tzaddik, and we're in Bria. And know ye that even though you quote unquote don't belong here, but don't think you have no impact here. And the mitzvahs you do at that level of awareness do stay here, even though you don't always see the consequence. And what's here really comes from the level of atzilus, which really ultimately comes from the essence of Hashem. And again, this is our biggest challenge. Why don't we sense it? Why don't we feel it? Okay, right, this is a, a challenge. And again, the neshama itself doesn't reside in these spiritual stages of awareness. It's just there, like the tourist, it's taking in the moment. He's sitting amongst the sages, sit at the dust of their feet. He's sitting amongst great people. There's a story, it's on the video, that in, in 1950, when the Rebbe came, was in, uh, even before 1950, in the life of the previous Rebbe, when the Rebbe came to America, I'm not sure if this was the, that first week, but when the Rebbe came to America, so the Rebbe had a fabrengen. 
So all the Bachram, how many Bachram were there? 25 guys, 20 guys? I mean, it was tiny. We're sitting around listening to the Rebbe's Fabrang. So Rabbi Label Posner, should live and be well, who's the father of our Rabbi Posner in Skokie, tells the story that he's sitting there. He, he doesn't know what's going on. He, he can't follow the Rebbe's talking. It's like he, he doesn't understand. So he turns to Rabbi Shustam in Oliver Shalom, who was the rough here in Chicago for many years, who was known as sort of the, 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 the one who would know. And he said to him, do you understand? And Rabbi Shusterman said something to him along the lines of, no, I don't understand, but be quiet. Meaning, why should be quiet? But I don't understand. Maybe go home. I don't understand. I'm not going to a lecture that's in Korean. I, why? Because you're in that presence. There is a value there. Uh, yes, it's true. You feel like an outsider. Yes, it's true. You feel like a guest and you feel like, oh, I am. Right? Because our sort of Western mentality is to raise my hand and I want to participate. I want to say something too. Okay, this is not innately a bad thing, but it doesn't allow us. So this is what the Alter Rebbe is saying, that the neshama is benefiting from the shechina. It's not subsumed within it. It stands there in Brio or Yitzira, and it, and it benefits, and which is not a bad thing. But it knows that it's not sort of not its residence. He knows he's going to go home. Hopefully not. Maybe he'll sustain it. You know, like Hashem says, that the uh, objective of Shemini Atzeres, the Yantav at the very end of Tishrei, is because I don't want you just to go home. What do you mean? We're going to go home tomorrow. So you're kicking it down the road one day. What's the big deal? Well, how have you remedied anything? Because you don't want us to be to go home. Well, that's it. So we won't go home today. We'll go home tomorrow. The idea is that it will be such an experience that we'll never be separated from Hashem. Yes, we're going to go home, but we're going to bring it with us. That's what our hope is. Even though we're going to go home, we want to carry that character with us when we leave. Who are in Seif Baruch Hu Meyucha Biyitzvirus the Bria Odi Yitzir, who Ziv Taydosim Avadas and Mamish, and that is that we have the uh, experience of this Ziv. Now the word Ziv translates as ray. It's a glimpse. It's a sense. It's like standing around this the, the tzaddik and saying, I don't know what he's talking about, but I just want to stay here. I don't know what it is. I just like it here. I just want to be in this level. And that's the consequence of the mitzvah. So when he's in that stage of awareness and he does a mitzvah, it is implanted in that stage of awareness. So even when he goes home, again, we hope not, but even if he does, and he goes back to being, quote, only human, he carries with him that ziv, that uh, residue of that experience. You know, we might think, what's the point? It's just going to be disappointing. You know, you have such a great time on Shabbos, but then you got to go back. Or it's like you think about vacation. You know, we go on vacation. What happens when you come back? Your problems are still there. The work is just piled up. But hopefully the point is you become reinvigorated. So now you're able to transform it and you're able to uh, operate with some residue of that experience. We hold on to Tishrei for the whole year. We hold on to each Shabbos for the whole week, uh, each Rosh Chodesh as we are for the whole week. All right, we'll stop here. We'll continue next to Vach. Okay. Uh, remember, uh, no, I don't want to do that. Stop share. And, uh, I was reading.